This presentation was recorded on my live stream and honestly, it was one of the best presentations I have ever seen in my life. No, this is not an ad. It's just an amazing walkthrough of the technology that is Tiger Beetle. You have to watch. Uh, thanks, Brian. Uh, pleasure to be here with you all. Uh, tell you a little bit about Tiger Beetle. Uh, Tiger Beetle is a financial transactions database uh, designed to be a thousand times faster than existing systems. Uh, so I want to share with you the techniques we use to achieve this performance. I uh, hope to convince you why Tiger Beetle is not only the fastest, but also the safest database we could possibly have built. Uh, but first, I want to tell you why we designed a database from scratch. Uh, so in the past, existing financial systems, uh, they take like a general purpose database. Uh, and then they'd add 10,000 lines of code around them uh, to record the debits and credits as money moves. So we noticed this in 2020. Uh, I was working on a central bank switch. Uh, it was by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, open source switch. And But looking around, we saw this is what they were doing. And then looking around everywhere else, we saw well, everyone else was also reinventing accounting over general purpose databases. So it was like a rite of passage. Uh, before you could work with money, you had to roll your own financial transactions database out of Postgres or SQLite. Uh, so the problem is that these databases give you the row level transactions engine, uh, but you still have to build the financial transactions chassis. You can't just get in and drive. Uh, the second problem is that the world is becoming more transactional. So financial systems today, they need to drive a thousand times faster than they did in the past uh, because transactions are becoming smaller and more frequent. For example, energy sources are changing uh, from, from coal to clean energy. So as you move to solar, the sun rises and sets and the price of energy changes. It's cheaper you know, when the sun is hot. Um, and it's maybe more expensive at night. So if your smart meter can transact energy every half hour, um, it's, it's, it's literally valuable. So you can actually arbitrage solar prices, but to do that, your infrastructure needs to handle a thousand times more load as you switch from monthly billing to, to half hourly billing. So you also see the same increase in the cloud as you move from dedicated servers and monthly billing to serverless and per second billing. Uh, except there, it's often just map produce billing every 15 minutes. Uh, so you can't always set real-time spend caps, and that's why cloud bills can get out of control. Uh, so cloud and energy are becoming real-time, and then there's actually real-time payments. So five years ago, India's real-time payment system, UPI, uh, processed 10 billion payments a year. Uh, the month of January alone, they did 12 billion. So the volume of transactions across several sectors has increased 100 to 1,000 times in the last 10 years. And yet the three most popular databases, Postgres, MySQL, SQLite, uh, they're 20 to 30 years old, designed for a different world and scale. Um, so it's one thing to build a car with an engine from the 90s, another to race Formula One. Uh, but if you want to break Mach 10, you need to rethink things, uh, not only performance, but especially safety. So this is the question we asked with Tiger Beetle. How can we take the four primary colors of computer science, network storage, memory, compute? How can we blend them into a faster, safer design for the future, for our kids, for the next generation, for the next few decades? So let's look at performance first. As you go through three orders of magnitude acceleration, uh, things get hot. Anything that's not aerodynamic burns up. So you suddenly see an impedance mismatch. And that's because while the language of databases is SQL, the language of financial transactions in the real world is really debit, credit. That's all that most financial systems need. However, if you want to debit credit to accounts and you trace the actual SQL queries that these systems do, uh, one financial transaction, you need around 10 SQL queries. And that is like kind of, you know, let's catch a, a plane from Cape Town to New York with one person in it. Then we come back again. Let's go again. Let's do that 10 times, you know, as you do the network round trip. And that is one financial transaction. And that's if you're pretty good. You know, they do a lot of direct flights. So it's a rule of thumb in many systems. Of course, you can use stored procedures to get this down to one, but that's only a 10x win. So we took a step back and said, hey, uh, debit credit is actually it's a pretty solid schema. Um, everything you need to represent the who, what, when, where, why, and how much of business. It's also small. You can pack one of these financial transactions, 128 bytes, just two CPU cache lines. Why not just pack a few of these together 
um, let's put a thousand of them in the plane and send them from Cape Town to New York in one trip. Uh, so that's one, you know, that, that's a one megabyte database query, 8,000 of these little um, 128 byte transactions. So that would give at least a thousand times more performance. And this is the breakthrough in Tiger Beetle. It's so simple, like we really did nothing special. This is all we did. Uh, let's just put 10,000 more things in the query and hopefully, you know, we should get a thousand times more performance. So when you make a trip to the database, 8,000 transactions in one query, and then these run through a single CPU core. It's a nice, hot, tight loop, no Rolox, no context switches. CPU is like a sprinter. You let it loose on the 100 meters, hard to go faster. So I think a lot of distributed systems in the past, they made the mistake, maybe, you know, people thought um, things were slowing down. So they made the mistake of betting on the speed of light in fiber. And then they take the data, cut it up, and they spread it across machines. And then when you want to transact across your accounts, the CPU must wait across the network, you know, to bring everything together. But the secret of financial transactions is that they're transactional. So there's always a counterparty. One of the parties is almost always your bank account. And there's just one of them. You can't, you can't shard it. Uh, so you could have a million customers. You can shard those. Uh, you know, you try to get a little bit of horizontal scalability, but all the shards are going to bottleneck on your hot bank account. Uh, so you're actually making things slower as you go horizontal, but now you're also getting lumpy, you know, network weather in your, late, in your P100 latency. So there's a saying that the number of people predicting the death of Moore's law doubles every two years. Uh, but I think if you bet against Moore's law, that could actually be twice as costly in two years as chips like the M3 keep transistor counts doubling. Um, so that's why if you look at high frequency trading, everyone's actually running single core. They're getting massive scale, going skyscraper vertical. Moore's law is that good, they say. So we were inspired here by Martin Thompson's LMAX thread per core design. Um, like LMAX, Tiger Beetle has replication. But like Almax, we don't make the mistake of going horizontal too soon. So we're not over distributed. Uh, we are distributed, multiple machines involved, there's replication, but we don't go too far. So there's a time for going horizontal, uh, I think, and that's where you drain to object storage. Uh, but that's only once your hot data has cooled. Um, so the architecture of Tiger Beetle, it's a classical replicated state machine. Uh, and I think this actually just really makes a lot of sense if you say it backwards. So it's a machine with state that you replicate. Uh, first, a request with 8,000 transactions comes in off the wire from the client. Second step, you log this to disk for durability, you replicate it in case a data center blows up. And finally, transactions are debited, credited to the accounts, reply sent to the client. So this amortizes the death by a thousand cuts of disk, network, even consensus. So you get the gold standard of perfect atomicity, consistency, isolation, durability by default and you're not sacrificing performance. So if you get the design right, things like consensus become free. They're not expensive. They're only expensive if the design is wrong, I think. So these are the big performance ideas. We also put a few cherries on top. Um, and here, performance is about what you don't do. So after startup, we don't call malloc or free. If you think through the physics of the database, how data flows, you can statically allocate the memory you need and decouple performance from memory usage. So because there are no hidden allocations, you get these hard P100 latencies, no GC spikes, and because every struct is handcrafted, you're also more efficient with memory. So gravity has inverted. Memory bandwidth is the new bottleneck. So you don't want to burn bandwidth or thrash the CPU cache with mem copies. So we try to be zero copy as far as possible. Uh, we do do a copy from the kernel's TCP receive buffer, um, but from there we use direct IO to DMA to disk. So we save copies also with zero deserialization, enforce little endian, what comes off the wires, what goes to disks, or fixed size cache line aligned structs. Um, and then to eliminate syscalls context switches, we talk to the kernel through IO Uring. Uh, use the kernel thread pool for async non blocking IO. So to handcraft everything like this, we wanted a systems programming language. And here the question was, should we invest in the language of the last 30 years, C or C++, or should we invest in a language for the next 30 years, ZIG and Rust? So with static memory allocation, we had a way to downgrade most issues around temporal memory safety. 
convert those from physical to logical. We didn't want a fearless multi-threading because of the performance overhead, and we had a single-threaded control plane uh, thanks to IO Uring. Uh, so Rust's borrow checker, while a great choice for many applications, made less sense for Tiger Beetle. At the same time, we wanted to handcraft memory, have no hidden allocations in the standard lib. You can see where I'm going with this, and we wanted to handle memory allocation failure. So Zig stood out uh, for its ability to work with memory explicitly, not to mention comp time. Um, you can program Zig while the, while the binary is being compiled, and that's just a force multiplier. So as a result, Tiger Beetle has zero dependencies, pure Zig, single binary. It's about the size of a floppy disk. So you get a whole distributed database, everything, and it's, it's, it's amazing just to actually shrink back to the past and get these small, small binaries. And then you run the single binary on a few machines. Now you've got a database. It's extremely reliable, predictable, easy to operate. And that's why we called it Tiger Beetle, uh, after one of the fastest creatures on Earth. Shout out to Don Changfoot, the original Tiger Beetle with me, uh, who coined the name. Um, and the Tiger Beetle has got the small footprint. You know, it's not only fast, but small, and it can thrive in tough environments. So why big iron when you can beetle? Uh, of course, it doesn't matter if your database is fast, if it's buggy. So processing financial transactions is close to nuclear. Not enough to be as safe as 30-year-old systems. You need to be 10 times safer. So to achieve this level of safety for Tiger Beetle, uh, we developed an engineering methodology called Tiger Style. Uh, Tiger Style is based on NASA's Power of 10 rules for safety critical code. We have over 6,000 assertions in Tiger Beetle. Uh, there's code to check the code. Everything is double, triple checked, thousands of tripwires. So we either run correctly in production or shut down safely. Again, static memory allocation is crucial uh, to give the operator a reliable piece of software with well-defined shape. So while these are techniques you don't see often, uh, Tiger, Be Tiger Style is starting to be adopted even just by other companies as engineering methodology. Uh, but for a database especially, you need to be durable. And here the research is exciting. Uh, for example, most uh, existing database designs are from before 2018. However, in 2018, uh, FSyncGate showed that databases don't always handle disk failure correctly. This can lead to data loss. And then in the same year, a paper from UW-Madison uh, called Protocol Aware Recovery for Consensus-Based Storage showed that distributed databases, even with replication, also don't handle disk failures correctly. And this can actually lead to global cluster data loss. So, for example, even with Raft, uh, Raft's formal proof didn't actually include a storage fault model. Uh, so the reason is that like SQLite, which is like it's the best of them all, um, most databases were designed to handle partial disk writes, you know, during power loss. That's what they were designed for. They weren't really designed for a whole other kind of storage fault beyond that. Um, so they assume the data they read is the data they wrote. Or if they do have checksums, they assume that the disk firmware will f-sync correctly or that they are reading or writing you know, from the, the right place on disk, and that might not actually be the case. So even checksums don't protect you here. Um, so these older designs, they can survive, they, they can't survive you know, the 1% of disks that misfire in a year, and this is a problem at scale. And that's why in 2020, we took this research, we just took it, you know, um, we stand on the shoulders and, and pay tribute to, to the researchers. And we, we took their recommendations and we designed Tiger Beetle to be one of the first databases to have a storage fault model. So the big idea is that if you already have replication, why wouldn't you want to embrace the end-to-end -end principle? Be like ZFS, but in the database, and then you make your database self-healing. So to do this, we took uh, the pioneering ViewStamp replication, or VSR consensus protocol from MIT. We integrated VSR with Tiger Beetle storage engine, so the consensus can repair each machine's storage engine. Uh, it's kind of funny, you know, consensus gives you replication, but for years it was never actually used to be self-healing. Uh, you have to throw the whole machine away and um, re-replicate a whole new one. You can't really heal these things. Um, but VSR enables Tiger Beetle to run across machines 
and then have multi-region automated failover. So when the data centers and disks are burning, VSR keeps your transactions churning. So to learn more, come join Matt Clad live on Twitch every Thursday for Iron Beetle. Um, he's doing these code work walkthroughs and the code is all on GitHub, Apache 2 open source. So it's been just over three years since we started from scratch. Our first production release around the corner, literally weeks now. And at scale, a single uh, Tiger Beetle cluster can already process 100 billion transactions. Just spin up a cluster and, and send them in. Um, or you can take a very small Raspberry Pi cluster, run Tiger Beetle on it, and maybe you can do 10,000 financial transactions a second. At least we could, you know, with micro SD cards, which are very slow. So on an office laptop, Things are getting a bit better. Tiger Beetle can do, you know, 300,000 financial transactions a second, and that's just indexing all the data. Uh, with primary indexes only, it's about 640,000 a second, and we're aiming for a million design target. Uh, here's the crucial quest question. How do you overtake databases with two to three decades of testing? For example, how do you test Tiger Beetle for two centuries every day? So Tiger Beetle was designed not only as a distributed database, but as a new breed of deterministic distributed database. So there are two databases in the world. The other is FoundationDB. They're like Neo. They can fight not only in the real world, but also in a simulation. They can train faster. So the simulator can speed up time. It can fuzz two centuries every day. Uh, it can take all our explicit fault models, inject them, check them like a formal model checker, but on the actual code. Uh, and then automatically open a GitHub issue for any bugs we find. And then we can replay these bugs again and again, just perfect reproducibility from a seed to fix them. So you get this massive developer velocity and a small team like ours can build a little beetle like Tiger Beetle. And this is how you know we feel this is the safest that we could possibly have built this. Um, but we also had some fun uh, with the simulator. So Zig is the kind of language where you're like, okay, we're writing a database, let's also make a game. So we took Zig, we cross-compiled the simulator that can run a virtual cluster. We cross-compiled the, the, the simulator to Wasm so we could run a whole Tiger Beetle virtually with like simulated network and everything, but we could run it all in like a browser tab. So our friends Fabio Arnold, Joey Max, they plugged the simulator into a Zig rewrite of Nano VG Game Engine. They drew illustrations on top so that as the simulation runs, you see everything visualized. So now that I've told you about Tiger Beetle, uh, I want to show you quickly about Tiger Beetle, uh, how it runs even in the browser. You know, normally you wouldn't do this at home. This is just a game, right? But it's a walking sim. And let's see, uh, Law of Demos. There we are. So what we've done, simulator again, and we've taken the fault models and we've said, let's just start easy. Let's just make everything, um, everything perfect. There's no hardware faults. Let's just run a database in the browser. Let's just see if we can do that. Uh, so it's going to be prime time. Everything is perfect. Are you ready? So here's a cluster of five, five Tiger Beetles descending. Um, these are them here. We can select our units. They're getting ready to start up. These are three clients that are going to send requests in from the network. There's our leader who's been elected. Wait for it. Wait for it. There they go. So the requests are coming in, the cluster is replicating, backing up and saying to the clients, we got this, we got your transactions and everything is perfect. And each of these beetles is actual real Zig Tiger Beetle code. They don't know that they're running in a simulation with fancy clothes. They just think they're a database, but they're in, they're in the browser thanks to Zig and Wasm. So that was pretty easy, let's, let's level up. This is now Red Desert. And what we're gonna do here is we're gonna introduce like a, a flaky network. So we're gonna mess with the network packets. Um, packet loss of 13%. We're gonna replay packets and do network partitions. There you can see the Mission Impossible 5 uh, glass box, which is causing network partitions. And we can also do these ourselves. Let's... I just put a network partition in. 
So the cluster now is trying to recover and elect a new primary, which is it's going to take a long time because we're just putting in so many faults here. But the simulator is checking that we're getting maximum availability and correctness, uh, and everything is working fine. If the screen crashes, then you know we found a bug. But so far, we're good. So this is like chaos just on the network, and everything is, is recovering fine. We're doing a leader election because the primary was partitioned. Let's do that one. And we made it. So this is sort of how far most databases go. Like if you can write a distributed database that can survive this, you know, then you've passed the Jepson test, which is pretty amazing. So this is really, really, really hard to survive. And no one really goes beyond this. But let's do that. Let's get radioactive. What we're going to do now is just corrupt 10% of our IO to disk on each beetle. And you can hear that in the music. So we've got 8% of reads are being corrupted, 9%. Each time you write a disk, 1 in 10 is going to get corrupt. And Tiger Beetle is going to detect this and self heal. We can crash a beetle as well. So now we're actually interacting and poking a deterministic simulation. engage duck mode as well so shout out to DuckDB one of the most awesome analytics databases and you can use DuckDB to crush a tiger beetle or you can zap them with a cosmic ray which is quite shocking but it survives we've done 31 requests and we're doing okay so far Getting close to the end. I think we're going to make it. <laughs> so far, so good. Zig is a lot of fun. <laughs> so again, shout out to Joey and Fabio who cooked this up and also to the whole Tiger Beetle team and all our friends and family and supporters. We did actually, we didn't only make the walking sim. We made a little, a little game within a game just to, to pay it forward. And so thanks to everybody who's... It's a whole lot of people that made this possible. And, uh, yeah, let us know if you can, if you can beat the highest score. Wow. Um, I'm pretty sure, you know, I, I'm not going to say that I know exactly what everybody is thinking, but I would just like to say that I'm pretty sure everybody here thinks that that's probably the coolest project they have ever seen in their lifetime. That was awesome. That was great. And the, the game was even better. Like the, the visualization of what was going on, the network not working, the pack. It's like you could see the kind of like the, the oversending between everything to try to recover and just watching it come back to life. Mwah. And then the crashing. Ah, it was yeah. fantastic. Because it's, it's hard to visualize what actually happens when people say all these things are happening. Like you don't actually have an idea of what it looks like. You actually got to see the thing in a cartoonish way. It was glorious. Yep. No, th thanks so much. This is kind of the dream is like, how can we show this just to kids, you know, and like let them see computers and distributed systems, see how this works and relate to it. And then we just had so much fun making it. So, um, yeah, it's just a privilege like that we can be doing this. And again, a whole team, you know, cooking this up and just having fun. So thanks. Thanks for the awesome. Uh, Glad, glad you enjoyed it. <laughs> this was glad honestly, it worked. Glad, was yeah. so awesome. Yeah. This you have no idea. This you just accidentally raised the bar for every technical presentation ever to exist from here on out. I'm not even sure what's gonna like. You, you're you're the Baldur's Gate three of technical presentations. Thank you. We're gonna have tweets now being like, "Great, you ruined it for everybody. We no longer want to do this." That well, was awesome. I'm just so glad we could. We could put you in there, Prime. I hope you liked liked uh, liked your throne Honored. that we had for you. Uh, Honored. Uh.
<laughs> All right, so so I'm sure we have a lot of questions. I, the first thing I saw is a lot of people were asking. So Tiger uh, Tiger uh, Tiger Beetle specifically designed around financial transactions, right? It's this is not a general purpose database. This is not a drop in replacement for Postgres. This is actually a specific financial database. Is that correct? That that's it. So this is like your bank vault. So normally, you know, we take people's money and we put it in the filing cabinet with all our general purpose data. And this is like this is like your bank vault. So you put the money in Tiger Beetle and then all the control plane meter data goes in your general purpose Postgres or SQLite. So it's just a separation of concerns. Um, but there's some good news is that the whole the whole of Tiger Beetle is kind of designed like like an Iron Man suit. So you can take the financial transactions um, state machine out, the business logic out, and you can put another database inside. So you can write your own business logic and use Tiger Beetle as a framework, and suddenly you've got a whole new distributed database. So we've been very careful like that. So actually, I'm kind of excited, you know, how we can make new databases with this as a framework. Yeah. All right. I mean, that that is even mind-blowing really is where we're at right now i think everyone in chat is just that they're having a hard time even imagining how awesome this thing is uh that's fantastic all right so i'm going to get some ch uh, some questions up from chat we'll see if anyone has anything that's worth saying uh chat always isn't the most reliable when it comes to insightful questions uh, but if there is anything we'll see yeah do you have more info on this tiger style do you have a like a article you can share with chat Anything you can point yeah, to? Because that great. is like so, I like the idea. I've done a little bit of a, like development on space stuff, and it was a very rigorous testing policy. So I'm very curious, how does this translate to real world software? Yeah, great. So thanks, thanks so much. So we, if you go to the Tiger Beetle repo, it's GitHub.com/slash/TigerBeetle/slash/TigerBeetle. In there, you go to docs and TigerStyle.md. It's the whole TigerStyle doc is right there. And then if you go onto Tiger Beetle's YouTube, we've got a talk there called Tiger Style. And there we sort of fill that in as well. So there's a talk, Tiger Style, and in the GitHub repo, Tiger Beetle slash Tiger Beetle, TigerStyle.md. You can also find our design doc for Tiger Beetle as a database, like how, you know, a lot of what I've showed you here too. So, nice. And if you use okay. Tiger Style, let, let, let us know, you know, if people use it, if you want to adopt it at where you work in a project, just let us know and we can put your logo there or sort of start a little bit of a movement. Uh, it's, I think there's three or four companies now using it, which is pretty cool. Well, can, can you give us like a, a quick, because you know, I'm looking through the MD and there's a, there's, a, there's a decent amount of words. It almost even looks like you might be quoting Bilbo Baggins down at the very bottom, but uh, yeah. shortcuts make long delays, as we always <laughs> like to say around here. I think that's Mary. But um, can you give us like the three super high level points of like, what is Tiger Style? Someone just walking by on the street. If you had to tell somebody in 15 seconds, what is it? So Tiger Style is a way that you can tackle the hardest, hardest software problem. You can ship it quicker, like five times quicker, five years quicker. If it's a 10 year project, you can do it in four or five. And you can do it to a quality and, and, and much, much tighter tolerances. So kind of like what we did with Tiger Beetle, the storage fault model. So those are the three big ideas. Um, tackle the hardest projects. Um, solve them quicker with much better quality. It, it, it's a way of taking responsibility as softwares again, as software developers again for like handcrafting software, but it's also quicker because of the deterministic simulation. So you're, a, a lot of the time on these projects, the hard projects, the time sink is the testing and debugging. So if you have a simulator that can speed up time and reproduce bugs for you, you can be fixing like 30 bugs in, in three weeks. Um, you, you just go so much faster. So it's you go slow to go fast. All right, all right. Um, is there is what is the primary um, way in which you are attempting to test this? Is it is it purely through simulation or fuzzing, or is there is there also like a recommendation on using asserts and all that? Is there like a code style enforcement, something like quote unquote clean code that you're trying to enforce, or is it just purely yeah. about testing nature? Okay, so it's the, the testing as well, but the, uh, the other, so Tiger Style is both. H how do you write code? How do you test code? In terms of writing code, it's not like, it's not very pedantic. So we say like, look, um, you know, it's, it's a, 
it's a tight, you know, it's a tight beat and a rare groove. It's both. So it, it's got a, a coolness about it that it evolves. It's not strict. It's not none of that. What, what we think of, like how you write code comes down to things like how you name things. Um, and there's a lot of tips there that we've learned. Like use, usually as programmers, we write variables as like least significant byte order. Um, so we'll say like max transactions, max replicas. And then we will have like, like time out for transactions. But now in the source, those things don't line up anymore. So if you switch it to most significant byte order, you'll get like, you'll get something like LSM table count max, um, LSM growth factor. And now all these things just are nice in the source. So there's little tips like that on the coding side. The, the biggest two tips on the coding side are assertions. Assertions are like, um, they're beautiful. So it's, it's basically saying, look, as you're coding, you're thinking about this stuff. You could write comments and it's great to do that, but also encode your expectations, what you expect, what you don't expect. Put that also in the code as assertions and, and, and we show you how to do that, that you can stay fast. So you separate control data plane and then you put your, your expectations into the code. And then as your code runs, if it's running correctly, great. If it isn't, it shuts down, you get a nice stack trace, you know exactly where it went wrong. Your, your, your understanding wasn't quite right. And then you, you tweak your understanding. So it's, it's fantastic you know, for a team. You, you can document your, your, all your knowledge in the code and then combined with the fuzzing, with the simulation test. Deterministic simulation testing is a bit more specific than f it's a certain kind of fuzzing where you actually can, you abstract the time that gives you timeouts in your code, then you can speed the whole system up and run it quicker. That, that's the key thing. Plus, when you run the software, it always runs the same time. So the, the, get, the game that I showed you is running real Tiger Beetle code. If you watch the game, it's always the same, and the code always runs the same every time. But when you combine the simulation testing with the assertions, that is really, really powerful because now you're, yeah, you, you, the simulator is also checking, you know, no split brain in the consensus log. It's checking many things, cache coherency of our user space page cache and what's on disk. The disk is being simulated so it, it can reach in and do all of this stuff. But your assertions also help to find a, a lot of bugs. So that's kind of the two, the, you know, how it, it's yin and, yin and yang. It plays nicely together. The assertions part is uh, particularly interesting because, you know, being able to build a simulator for this is probably not tenable for most computer problems that people are building software for that they, they you know you can't it's it will be very hard for me to convince my boss that i need to simulate disk writing and all that right like he's even like okay slow yeah. down we're just you're just querying some mongo data let's let's slow it down a little bit here uh but the idea of putting in assertions which is something i've just started to do a lot more ever since listening to that uh podcast with Les, lex friedman and uh Carmack, where he talks about how he largely drove correctness through assertions. And I realized, like, I never did a lot of asserting. And that actually seems like such a powerful technique because you do get such good information and you know exactly what has gone wrong. It is so much more clear than undefined is not a function. It's more like, no, this was the expectation. We did not, like, get there. So, therefore, the undefined not a function that's a consequence of who knows what just doesn't happen because of the assertion. And so I, I love that. I think that that is such a, an amazing thing I, I do have a follow-up because you do a lot of automatic uh, mm. posting of github issues i saw that that which was by the way super mm. cool that you have this do you ever accidentally yeah. like post a security exploit by accident due to automatic github issue posting like do you have to have some sort of filtering on this to prevent people from performing naughty stuff mm. Uh, great question. Yeah, so we, we, we thought a bit about that. So the, these reports come from our simulation infrastructure. We run 100 CPU cores 24-7. So you, get, you do get two centuries of test time every day that's simulated. But so it's actually like it's it's just it's not it's not um, w this is not reports coming from production deployments of Tiger Beetle. So this is there's no user data. These are, f you know, from it, it's the simulator that sends the reports uh, tiger beetle proper d doesn't have that code to do that so that's yeah and and also um what was interesting prime is that the simulator the first version of it took it was 600 700 lines of code and it took three weeks to build so the tricky part was just that we had to think about it up front like with tiger style so we built tiger beetle for a year 
with these ideas in mind. And because we had it like that, then the simulator took three weeks. So it, wa it wasn't it wasn't actually and, and then it really sped us up because you know often you can sink like two or three engineers just into testing um, and then this now it's it yeah you, you sort of you can re you, you give yourself a ratchet that you you make things reliable and then and you you can now sort of do like bio digital jazz as you work on these protocols you can try really cool stuff like with the self-healing protocols or algorithms because now you've got a way to like climb these mountains safely with a rope Okay. Okay. That's I, I do. I do actually really like this because I now my brain's spinning about this because right. we have a particular problem of an internal tool in which needs to become more reliable, and a lot of it is just like the problem is we do a lot of stuff through mocks and and testing, and so you know all the tests seem to pass, but the reliability still is fairly low, and so it's like okay, so maybe we can actually play these things in a more real environment that actually causes the real problems to be exposed, and so something very very interesting about that that I'll. I'll I'll definitely want to think about more because the simulation, you're right. If you think about it ahead of time right. and you put in the proper hooks and everything so that when the day comes, you have to write it, you can write it in hundreds of lines of codes as opposed to rewriting things from on both sides to try to line up. So it is something that's very interesting that's if you have long-term projects. Think that maybe a simulator might be a, a potential future at some point. Um, all right, the, the, yes. the, Judo keeps asking this question. Are there any plans to support the modeling of transactions other than numeric types? For example, if we... We were, let's see, if one were to create a data type and corresponding logic functions for how to apply those transactions to an account, add, subtract, et cetera. Mm, yeah, cool, awesome. So if you, if you go into our repo, um, look for statemachine.zig. That is the business logic. So you, you could actually just go and change it and then you compile it and, and then that's your database. Uh, so you, you can, if you, if you wanna like really customize it, you can. Uh, and uh, yeah, and and then you get all this infrastructure comes with it free. So you get the static you don't, in the state machine. You don't worry about static allocation. You don't see it there. So we've kept all that away. You just get to write really nice um, imperative uh, business logic. There's no I/O, no concurrency. It's it's a very cozy environment. You get the simulation testing comes with it. Uh, mm. Yeah, and and we're hoping to sort of extract this as a library open source VSR so that other projects can build on VSR and just have a rock solid foundation. That is awesome. Okay, uh, one quick kind of more boots on the ground practical question. Uh, a big thing when it comes to system languages right now, people are very excited about Rust. And one of the big downfalls of Rust, of course, is the compile time. They just, you know, meme after meme about the compile time. What is it like working in a larger Zig project? Do you find that the, the tools surrounding Zig and also just like developer happiness if you will uh, what is that like including compile yeah, time uh, so i think okay great awesome question so um we love rust as well so we like to say you know rust and zig and there's there's a time and a place and so matt clad on the team wrote rust analyzer so it's been very interesting to see you know in terms of tooling like what 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 can we do for zig and zig has got zls which is great by august and um and zig is is it feels good for us you know we've we've got a little open issue of things we're learning um, things maybe can improve in this in standard library we had something awesome the other day where we've got now zig build check so you can check your source you don't you're not actually interested in the binary you just want to check that that it would compile but that is so so fast so like it was just today in slack someone was saying wow just it is, it's hard to believe how fast this is um, and what is Exciting with Zig is how much they're investing not only in the language but in the whole tool chain, you know, the cross compilation story, but also like they're thinking the next 30 years as well. You know, do we still want LLVM in 30 years? For sure. But but do we also want new stuff, like new backends for sure? So like it's so nice to see that they're they're doing that as well. So um, it's it's been a overall it's been a fantastic experience. Like we'll find if we find a bug like this happened two days ago, we found a small bug in the standard lib um, around process execution. And 
when we reported it, it had already been fixed because the language is just going so fast. So if this is what we want. You know, what, uh, we don't want a, a language where you know it, it takes a year to to get I O U ring in. Like is, we just put it into Zig and it was there. So the velocity you get and it's a great community now. It's a perfect time. It's like you want to paddle out and catch that swell now and nice people hanging at the back line there. Awesome. That is that is super good. Um, hey, is there any where where can people find out more about Tiger Beetle about any of this stuff? What is the best you know mediums to use? Yeah, so we're on Twitter, uh, Tiger Beetle DB on GitHub. So there's a lot of like day to day info there. Um, we've got a our newsletter. We put a lot of time into it just as engineers. So we like every single PR we do. I, it's the weirdest newsletter because every single PR we like write a whole story about it, like the whole backstory of what was going. I mean, the PRs themselves, you know, you can read it there too, but it's a nice way to see like a, a very detailed change log. Um, otherwise, yeah, uh, GitHub is the best place. Uh, so github.com, Tiger Beetle, Tiger Beetle, and then join our Slack for questions. We're happy to, um, we just love to pay it forward and connect with people and make friends and have fun. Awesome. This was absolutely fantastic. Thank you, Jorn, for joining us. Um, the presentation, again, oh. was you've set a new bar. So really appreciate that. <laughs> uh, I think the Beatle just did it prime. So we just follow where the inspiration strikes and zig. And um, so, so nice to have so much fun, you know? Um, yeah. So, and thanks, thanks to you and to everyone. It's really awesome to hang out.